Hi, my name is Bob Grunier and I'm a volunteer with the Martin Fleischmann Memorial Project. So I have to say, Carl Page has done an absolutely incredible job with the organisation of this year's ICCF 24. I'm very sad that I couldn't be there, but you all know why. Uh, anyway, uh, it was an excellent first day yesterday and there was a lovely anime to start off the day and there was some really cool uh, um, rapping uh, by an artist, uh, which was really very clever and very different for the field. And it was a nice mix between sort of investment aspects and sort of elevator pitches and moonshots and also some hard data coming from US Navy and also NASA. Some things that were a bit of a surprise to me, but when looking at the uh, NASA research, it's not such a surprise because you see the same kind of features in the Fralic paper from 2020 that we see in our work and in Matsumoto's work, these sort of ring spots and also these kidney shaped, or as I like to call them, sort of figure eight uh, cardioid type structures where the transmutations are occurring in their case in a, a Johnson Matty uh, hydrogen purifier, which apparently Fralic uh, first used and way back in 1989 and reprised in 2012 and more recently for the 2020 paper. Anyway, it was really excellent today. Uh, day and today is uh, more um, uh, on uh, other people's work, and I've just enjoyed um, Steve's work on economy. So there's it, it, it is a nice mix of different types of presentations. Uh, and there was some work for, uh, presented from the MIT group and so forth. But anyway, um, I have to address something here because uh, there was something said by one Peter Hegelstein in a question to the panel with Matt Trevithick, uh, David Nagal, Robert Duncan and Thomas Schenkel, who is from Lawrence Barclay National Lab. And he said uh, that, um, I don't know whether I caught this wrong, but uh, it was a complete shock to me that apparently, according to one uh, Peter Hegelstein, uh, there has been over 400 failed Parkamov replication attempts. Okay, he didn't talk about anything successful, uh, but he did say that there's been over 400 uh, Parkamov replication attempts. And that why why are you bothering? And apparently, according to Jed Rothwell, uh, Peter warned Google that it would not work. And this is really surprising. And and I don't know what they did. I mean, it, I don't know whether they were all done by Google. Um, I don't know whether they were done by multiple parties. But since I presented uh, on behalf of Alexander Parkamov in 2019 and ICCF 22. I can't remember a single person approaching me, and, I, and certainly Alexander has not told me of a single person approaching him, but maybe they, he has, and I will verify this, uh, for these 400 attempted replications. And I don't know where they are getting their PNK02 uh, carbonyl nickel from, which has these very specific dendritic structures on there. And I don't know whether they're using silicon carbide for their reactor tube, whether they are, they are using a, a tungsten heater filament in a hydrogen shroud. Uh, and, and given the fact that the silicon carbide and the tungsten are most likely the fuel that are burnt by the uh, exotic vacuum objects that are produced uh, in the careful preparation and heating process of the PNK02, which I essentially explained in ICCF22 and have detailed very clearly since. I have no idea how they did all those things and failed and didn't publish anything. I mean, it's just incredible that this went on. It's like secret failures times 400. So I would like uh, for the data from these 400 failed replication attempts to be made public. I think it is extremely important because I don't want anyone to be wasting their time because he was not doing a lithium aluminium hydride experiment. We sh showed in Bang, I think in 2015 or 16, whenever it was, that the lithium aluminium hydride coats the surface, the dendritic surface of a carbonyl nickel. We were using a different type, but it, uh, in this case, you could very clearly see that in the Edmund Storms analysis of our bang uh, core. And so we knew for a long time that that was preventing uh, sort of hydrogen interacting with the surface of the nickel. And 
Parkamov learned this early on. He, he found that the lithium and the aluminium basically prevent the process from occurring. And I specifically said that at ICCF uh, 22. That uh, it, and, and actually it was to a question by Peter Higgleston. Uh, and I said there, there is no lithium aluminium hydride in here. This is uh, specifically just hydrogen and this PNKO2 uh, nickel and that... Uh, um, uh, that was what was producing some kind of thing, which we've uh, discussed in great detail since, that was going on to do the work, and it was not relevant that the nickel, therefore, at the end of producing these things that do the work, was then in a molten state, because it isn't the nickel that's doing the work, it is the structures that were produced by the nickel uh, early on in the process. And um, the fact that the calcium went from 1% to 20%, and we have... Uh, seen in 2019 also when you take HHO and you put it onto in the case of a Mars gas and you put it onto uh, tungsten you get the formation of calcium which is almost the most likely element to be produced after the um, the uh, rare 0.2% uh, uh, or whatever it is isotope of uh, 180 that uh, essentially in my view alpha decays uh, it, the, most of the other isotopes uh, produce calcium and so that would be one way forward or it would be th through the fusion uh, uh, of um, uh, uh, I think silicon carbon maybe of the the core anyway the, the point being here <laughs> that, that's you know silicon is 28 and carbon is 12 so um, you could have the fusion from that but uh, so it's either fission or it's fusion. We have re we saw this from uh, HHO on a which we know creates the coherent matter clusters, uh, and uh, uh, this produces the micro ball lightning, and and this can cause the the process in tungsten. And we replicated that with David Butillier in in um, Canada. So it, I I have believed for a long time that the tungsten is the fuel. That is to say, tungsten fissioning is the main part of the fuel, and or silicon carbon in the silicon carbide tube so were these 400 failed replications using lith lithium aluminium hydride if they were well they weren't paying attention were these uh, uh, experiments using the uh, pnko2 russian made carbonyl nickel if they weren't they probably failed because of that um, were they using a tungsten filament for the heating uh, and like I say, I believe that that's probably where most of the excess heat was actually coming from, although the active agents were produced on the dendritic uh, points of the uh, nickel in, in combination with the hydrogen in the core. Okay, so uh, that being said, um, I'm very much looking forward to seeing the data and the approach taken and the protocols. And I've described very, very precisely uh, how what we codified into the uh, signal uh, um, uh, heating protocol, which was a combination of what we learnt in 2015 from Piantelli and uh, what we knew from public information from Parkamov, uh, produced the signal in GS 5.2, glow stick 5.2, where we were actually using lithium aluminium hydride, but we couldn't replicate that again. Uh, uh, the exact observation of the signal which I believe was a coherent matter structure an exotic vacuum object uh, doing an EMP and saturating our various sensors and tripping our power monitor and so forth um, uh, because that's an event but uh, th those things were timed together but anyway th the point being is that um, uh, we uh, I've explained that the nickel does on the surface with all the electrons. Uh, the fact that it doesn't absorb the hydrogen, it adsorbs to the surface. This uh, um, is kind of like split and magnetically bound. And then Piantelli told us very specifically you have to work to get as much of this um, uh, bound or adhered hydrogen onto the surface and then you go through the Curie temperature as absolutely fast as possible and I've explained that I believe that allows for all of these bound magnetically bound protons uh, on the nickel to come off all at exactly the same time they are therefore at the same energy and they are therefore the same de Broglie wavelength and in concert with the electrons on the surface they form coherent matter or an itonic cluster as per Alexander uh, uh, as per uh, um, 
Takaki Matsumoto, which is a form of micro ball lightning or an exotic vacuum object. And this goes out and does other work, whether it's in the silicon carbide or whether it's in the uh, tungsten in the other parts of the reactor. So I, th this has all been detailed. Not one person that is supposed to have done these 400 failed replications have uh, uh, reached out to me. So I'm, I'm going to ask Alexander Parkamov if he was approached for his insights in delivering a working replication. But what I can say is when the U University of Missouri attempted to replicate our GS 5.2 results, they changed practically every uh, important metric and the, the, the shape of the reactor, the processing of the materials, the fact that it was completely um, in uh, a brick cage to make it nice and even temperature. And I actually specifically said at ICCF 22, this is not the way they do it. it. We failed in our first Chalani replication because we tried to do something different to what Chalani was doing. We succeeded because we took away the quartz tubes, which he wasn't using at that point, and we replaced it with uh, borosilicate tubes, which as I've said in, in the past, it has boron, it has uh, silicon carbonate, and each of these things I've, I've uh, s spoken about uh, are able to interact with uh, both neutrons, but, but most importantly, the pseudo-neutron structures. And so th that is where you are measuring your excess heat from. Otherwise, it just walks straight through uh, normal quartz. And so um, this this is it, it, it's a little bit shocking because I, I did mention that even at ICCF 22 that uh, the University of Missouri changed all these parameters and they changed the parameters to fit in the working week and to fit in the working day. And when we did GS 5.2, it was a continuous 24 hour experiment over more than one week and it involved round the clock monitoring. And that was just not something they could do. And the other thing that I mentioned at ICCF 22, which people are overlooking, and this is the failure point for University of Missouri's uh, replication. And I told them at the time, ICCF 18, well, uh, uh, that's not going to work because what they had is they had a ceramic support with a heater in the middle in a, a, in a uh, chamber, which meant everything was exactly the same temperature and the wire was wound around, around, around this ceramic support. So it would not work. And, and uh, we had already identified from a uh, bolometer, uh, uh, an IR, uh, a FLIR sensor, that basically between where we were supporting the Chalani wire and the gaps, there was like a 100 degree difference. And so, you know, uh, you're not replicating Chalani. And in the ICCF 22 presentation, I said there is a critical thing that was talked about by Piantelli, which is not disclosed in his patents, and that was to have an, an absolutely critical temperature gradient. And how he achieved that is in his patents, it's actually a constant wind from one end to the other, whereas in, in actuality, it was tightly bound at one end, and then it opened out. And this produced a temperature gradient, which means you are parameter sweep, space sweeping within that metal rod. And so where the uh, phonon vibrations, the, the uh, uh, terahertz, the, the thermal IR vibrations were exactly at the resonant mode to trigger the reaction, that is where it occurred. And if it heated up the rod, it would move slightly up or down depending on uh, what is important in terms of the, 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 the vibrations were key, that were key to running the experiment. And we could see that it was, I don't know, six millimeter section of that nickel rod, which where all of the action was occurring. I said that at ICCF 22. No one, no one has reached out to me. And the fact that he can basically, uh, in, in this open forum, unchallenged, say that, why are you bothering doing these experiments when 400 failed? I can tell you, ICC, the, the University of Missouri failed in that replication. I could see it straight off. Uh, uh, because they were having the whole thing at the exact same temperature for Chalani. The same thing that they did when they tried to replicate uh, our uh, GS 5.2. There was no parameter space sweeping inherent in their design. There was none of that. And so, you know, they. Uh, um, uh, if you want something to be exactly the right uh, temperature to trigger the effect, you have to have... Um, the exact temperature at the exactly the right time. You cannot do what we did with GS 5.2 with the experimental design, uh, which was not a replication at all in any shape or form, with uh, uh, with um, uh, the GS 5.2 with with what they did at the University of Missouri. The reason being is you can't 
get close to the Curie point and go immediately through it. And I don't believe you can do the same thing because of the thermal mass and the hysteresis and, and, and this thing that you have to move. At, uh, 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 you can't move very, very quickly when you've got a Chalani wire wound on a um, uh, a coil. So the, the, the whole em three times emissions we were receiving when we were injecting fresh hydrogen, cooling it below the Curie point, and then it, it heats itself up uh, and goes through that Curie point again, produces these uh, coherent matter structures and, and, and they come off. It's just not possible with this approach. So I expect that these people, if this is in fact true, and they managed to fail 400 times, right? They weren't using the protocol. They weren't using the equipment. And um, uh, they, they probably were trying to put it in some fancy calorimeter, which makes it impossible to have a temperature gradient and also makes it impossible to in almost instantaneously go through the Curie temperature. And therefore, there was not 400 failed replications. There were 400 failed experiments at to create the, 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 the Lenner effect, which were nothing to do with Alexander Parkhamov's experiment. They just weren't the same experiment. So I challenge you, Peter Hegelstein, to show me the data that you used to justify the comment at ICCF24, and we can discuss whether it is a replication or not of what I tried to clearly uh, give as much information as I can in a 20-minute slot with 10 minutes of, uh, uh, of questions at ICCF 22, answering your questions precisely, as clearly as I could in as short time frame as possible. And, you, you know, and, and all of the other information that they decided to put into these 400 failed not replication replications. Okay, so please, Peter Hegelstein, I ask you to reach out and I would be very happy to do this on a live uh, discussion where you can tell me all the things that they did exactly right which are the replications and all the things that clearly showed that the replication each time they did it these 400 replications uh, uh, that they failed okay so uh, with that I'm going to enjoy a, a little bit of break because they're on lunch at the moment and uh, go back and enjoy the rest of the day um, Thank you very much for your time and I'll see you in the next video.